When economic policy analysts need to evaluate the consequences of market changes, they aren't confronted with linear textbook demand and supply curves. Generally, they know where the market is now, have data on demand and supply elasticities, and rely on the recognition that those elasticities are unlikely to change much for the sort of changes one is likely to encounter in practice. So they perform approximations to the sort of analysis one would do if one could see the actual demand and supply relations. They perform what we call back-of-the-envelope calculations, good enough to get magnitudes for the consequences of predicted trends or the consequences of alternative policy interventions. This back-of-the-envelope comparative statics example relies on the results, derived in another screencast, that the market equilibrium price responds to demand and supply shifters according to these elasticity relationships, which you ought to have handy in your notes. The idea is that we can measure the shift from Q0 P0 to Q1 P1 based solely on the size of the demand shifter and the known elasticities. Holding price constant at P0, a change in a demand shifter alpha, say an increase in the price of a substitute or family income, would shift out quantity demanded by the percentage change in alpha times the alpha elasticity of demand. But that would result in excess demand driving up price. The percentage change in the price needed to restore equilibrium is a function of both the price elasticity of demand and the price elasticity of supply. Multiply the original price by the percentage change and add to the original price to find P1. The shift from Q0 to P1 the shift from Q0 P0 to Q1 P1 is a movement along the supply curve. So we find the percentage change in quantity by multiplying the percentage change in price by the own price elasticity of demand and use that to obtain the new quantity. Let's apply this approach to an example. Gentrification is the phenomenon in which higher income individuals move into a real estate market. The immediate effect is a big jump in rents and existing residents, particularly low income residents, request the government to institute rent controls. Suppose a typical apartment rents for $600 a month and 8,000 units are rented out each month in the initial equilibrium. Our research has revealed these elasticities, these characteristics of demand and supply. What will be the impact on the market if the influx of new residents results in a percentage change in income of 40 percent? A huge transformation of the neighborhood. We can find the responsiveness of the equilibrium price to the shift in income by computing this elasticity. That is, we want the 2.4 over the elasticity of supply, which is 0.5 minus negative 0.7, which will give us 2.4 over 1.2, or 2. The new price will be the old price times the percentage change in price, which is 2 times 0.4 or 0.8. So this is going to be for 80. So P sub B is going to be equal to 600 times 1 plus 0.8 or 1080. This 80% price increase would hit existing residents hard. They'd see their consumption of rental housing fall to 
to point C on the graph. QC is equal to the original quantity minus the reduction in quantity, which is the 80% increase in price multiplied by the own price elasticity of demand, negative 0.7. So we subtract negative 0.56 from 1 to get 0.44, multiply that by 8,000 to get 3,520 units rented by original residents of the neighborhood. It is understandable why families losing their homes might lobby the government to impose rent controls. But, as you learned in introductory economics, rent controls lead to excess demand. To compute just how much, that is, point D on the graph, note that a 40% increase in income with no upward adjustment in price allowed would result in a quantity demanded of Q sub D equal to the original 8,000 plus 2.4, the income elasticity, times the 40% increase for a total of 15,680 units versus the 8,000 that the market makes available. So, we have excess demand of over 7,600 apartments, a major housing shortage. Worse, there is no mechanism by which this shortage can be resolved. Had the price been allowed to rise, housing would have yielded profits, stimulating entry, new construction or building conversions, and a shift out in supply. To assess the long-run efficiency consequences of imposing a price ceiling, we need to know how the market would have adjusted in the long run to the shift out in demand. So, we need to find the long-run equilibrium point E, reflecting the long-run elasticity of supply, which is positive but less than the short-run elasticity because of land scarcity. That is, there are real economic rents earned in housing markets. Price at the new equilibrium is equal to the old price times 1 plus the elasticity of the equilibrium price, which is 0.5, times the percentage change in income, 0.4, and that's going to be, in this case, 720. The new quantity is the old quantity, the 8,000, times 1 plus the elasticity of supply, the long-run elasticity of supply, 4.1, times the percentage change in price. So that's just the 120 over the original 600, and that results in a new quantity of 14,000. 560. But with price controls, only 8,000 units continue to be provided. We need to consider the lost surplus from the 6,560 units that were not produced and rented. That is, we need to figure out how high rents would need to go to rise above the 720 following the shift out in demand to clear the market at 8,000 units sold, 8,000 units rented. So starting at 14,560, we need to figure out what percentage change in price would have been needed to generate a 14,560 minus 8,000 divided by 8,000, or 45 percent reduction in quantity and move us to point F on the graph. Since the percentage change in quantity is equal to the elasticity times the percentage change in price, then the percentage change in price 
is going to be equal to the percentage change in quantity divided by the price elasticity. That's equal to negative 0.45 divided by negative 0.7. Multiplying that by 720, we get a price increase of 463 dollars. So PF is equal to 1183. The deadweight loss resulting from imposing the price controls is just the area of the triangle connecting our points A, E, and F, which is a total of about $1.9 million under the best of circumstances. $1.5 million in lost consumer surplus and $0.4 million in lost producer surplus. Another way of thinking about this is that renters and providers of housing services as a group gain $1.9 million from allowing the market to function freely in response to gentrification. These resources are potentially available to compensate families injured by the gentrification. That is, by allowing price to rise freely, we could use some of the resulting gain in total surplus over the rent control case through taxes, to make housing affordable for the original residents, many of whom would elect to stay in the neighborhood. Okay, to sum up, we can use observable elasticities for the responsiveness of demand and supply to changes in price and changes in demand-supply shifters to calculate an elasticity for the responsiveness of the equilibrium price to changes in a shifter. This then becomes the basis for back-of-the-envelope estimates of the resulting comparative statics and the welfare consequences of policy interventions or other exogenous changes to markets.